Everyone, uh, appreciate you being here for this uh, live episode of Social on the Sidelines. Uh, we're pretty much 22 episodes in, I think. For those who don't know, um, I have a co-host, Amara Baptist, who, who does what I do for the uh, Portland Trailblazers, um, oversees their social strategy. And uh, really, we try to interview talented folks like Brian here um, at different organizations throughout sp sports, um, trying to get a gauge on how they got to where they're at, You know, advice for people trying to get to where they're at. Um, and just some of the experiences, journeys they've had along the way. So to start out here, Brian, uh, appreciate you being here um, no and welcoming us to, to BR. For sure. Um, so as, as part of your title as Deputy Director of Social Moments, how'd you get there? Uh, short version or long version? I mean, I mean I, I'm, I, I'm down for both. <laughs> for sure. Um, I, I jokingly talked to my, my colleagues about taking the long way into media because I didn't have a very direct path. I actually, in undergrad, focused on economics, went to business school, um, left business school, and after like taking every career assessment to hopefully like be told what was for me, ended up in the industry that was for me. So I knew sports media was where I was supposed to be, but I was kind of like looking to be told what I needed to do. And so ultimately, um, I, I made my way to BR, um, started in the operations part of the, the building, and then uh, helped build the team that I currently oversee. Got so, it. Yeah. So a little bit of background on, my, on myself, for people that don't know, um, I oversee the social team at the Minnesota Timberwolves and Lynx. Uh, and this is my fifth season in the NBA. Um, I've been in social for about seven. Um, I actually started as an electrical engineer. Um, I'm Pakistani. Um, which in a stereotypical, uh, most families are wanting their sons and daughters to be doctors and engineers. And I told my mom I wanted to work in social in the NBA and she was like, what? So that wasn't really, yeah. it, it wasn't um, a possibility. Right. And I applied to the Tim Rules for pretty much my first two years of college, didn't get the gig mm. um, and applied to every social media internship I could. Um, working at a rehabilitating wildlife center, doing their mm. social media for like birds, which I knew nothing about. Mm. Um, and really what I tried to do the third time that I applied to the Timberwolves was like, I know I've applied with you guys before, I just need you to take a look at my resume. Right. And from there, it just kind of got started. Um, right. More into BR though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about the setup with the social team. I've been to the, I've had the pleasure of going to the SF office and then the new, this office as well, sure. and the sheer amount of work that goes on behind the scenes is insane to me with so many different people working around the clock to get all of these people in here, plus right. millions around the world, right. content on the fly. That's great content. Sure. What goes into that? Lots and lots of planning, uh, analysis, um, creative honesty, um, and manpower. I mean, you know, one of the things that we talk about constantly is you know, let's just be blunt with each other. Let's be really, really clear on what really moves the needle. It's not enough to spend a lot of time and energy creating something. Like once you created something, cool, you, you made something. But now is it good? And not just is it good, is it like worthy of like stopping someone from scrolling past it on their timeline? Or is it actually standing out next to another publisher who's trying to compete and create content around the same exact event that we're creating content for? So. Um, that type of energy is like, you know, what you're going to get if you're in any of our brainstorms or any of our Slack conversations. Um, you know, we have like a, a healthy relationship with each other. It's always respectful, but more than anything, it's like we're not we're not going to fake the funk with each other. We're going to like keep it very, very um, honest and clear about okay, this meets the bar and this doesn't meet the bar. Um, and we're also honest about like okay, this is this is stale. And generally speaking, when we say like something is stale to us, it means that other publishers are about to start doing it. So we, we're kind of like on to the next thing, putting more time and energy and research into like what that next frontier, frontier can be. And, um, and just kind of keeping that, you know, keep, keep continuing to push the, push the envelope, you know, creatively. And not being fearful of failing either, you know. And by failing, I'm, I really mean not meeting whatever your average engagement is or whatever your average video view count is cross-platform. Um, when you're doing something new, sometimes you're not only adjusting to what it takes to do it from a production standpoint, but you're educating the audience on what, that, what this execution looks like and how they should interact with it. And that might not come along with all of the KPIs that you would hope it would come with, but you're trying it. 
you're trying something new and you're showing the, the audience new possibilities. Absolutely. So you talked a little bit about not being afraid to fail and from an outside perspective for people that might just watch social casually, especially with an account like BR where every fourth comment is delete this. And I can, <laughs> yeah. I, I can resonate with that because, you know, at the start of the season, the Jimmy Butler fiasco was going on and we yeah. would, as an organization, we would have to cover that because right. he was on the team. Right. Um, but you know, we would post a photo and we'd get the same type of stuff. How yeah. do you deal with that and continue to innovate in a creative fashion while also understanding that some of these users are just doing it yeah. to do it? Yeah. I mean, honestly, like it's, it's two big things. First is that like honestly, anybody that's on our social team, whether it's like my group or any of the other groups that we have here, like. I trust their taste, and I believe that like these people have the best taste in the industry, bar none. Um, so I trust that. Second, like the Twitter comments and IG comments and all that kind of stuff, like it's the it's it's the mob. Like I don't know, some people are just doing it for clout. They're doing it for retweets. They're, they they want right. to get their own page popping. They want right. to get their own account. Like they you know they want likes. They want shares. They're like you know if they get a certain amount of retweets, they're dropping SoundCloud leaks and stuff like that. Like cool. All right. right, if you can come up off of our content, you're welcome. <laughs> but we're not really stressed about that. You talked a little bit about some KPIs. What does success look like? And I know that's a broad question, but yeah. what do you define as success specifically when it comes to social yeah. for BR? Yeah, um, I mean, first I, I would just point to one that I think we all look at, which is like engagement you know, cross-platform. We're looking at comments, we're looking at likes, we're looking at shares, retweets, things like that. Um, informally and far less measurable is like, did this piece of content find its way back to me using another channel? So in any of the 14,000 group chats I'm in, did someone drop this? Forgetting or not thinking that I might have done it. You know, that's like, that's the measure or the metric that I'm like, okay, this resonated. You know, certain things, um, we just were, you know, in the middle of a Black History Month project, you know, that made its way to one of our, one of my group chats where I'm like, okay. Got it. This is organically, and this isn't just people supporting the project because they know I work here. It's like, oh no, they watched it, they engaged with it, they enjoyed it, you know? So those are kind of the, 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 the main things we're, we're looking at. Absolutely, so between New York and SF, a lot of people might not realize that all the content that's going on is being developed at these two different places, but still yeah. going on to the one platform. Yeah, for What's sure. the communication? Like, I, I've seen some of those Slack channels that I'm not envious, because I those that's a lot going on there. How do you it's, guys? work with all that it's it's 24 7 i mean you know folks on my team i'm sure like are tired of me slacking them at random odd hours when i like i'm in a youtube wormhole and i'm like we should do something like this or we should right. but it's, it's just communication and then just organizing fortunately we have like phenomenal people on and around our team that like have a way to structure and and funnel all of our creative energy into measurable actionable okay, this is, okay, we said we like this about this project we did this time, next time we do it, that's gonna inform how we, you know, the next iteration of it. Or, you know, we put together X, Y, and Z pieces of content from out there in the, in the universe and these are inspirations, okay, what about these particular pieces of content, you know, do we like? And then, you know, and that's just through using tools that everybody has access to. That's Google Drive, that's Docs, that's all of those kind of things. But it's really the discipline. It's the, you know, the actual discipline of the professionals that we have on our teams to like be very serious about, about the work. And whether it's uh, super short form content on social, like less than 60 seconds, or longer form stuff, like what we're starting to do on our YouTube channel, um, we're taking it serious. Absolutely. So between everything that you guys are doing, obviously, um, there's like we've been talking about, there's been a lot of work that's put into it. What are kind of some hiring practices that you guys have put in place? Or what do you think of when it comes to hiring talent to put out the sheer amount of creative, creative stuff that you guys have? For sure. Honestly, um every new person I'm bringing onto the team adds something to the room. Like there, there's, you know, I get past a lot of resumes, a lot of LinkedIn's, a lot of like, you know, folks that are great. They're like really dope people. But my, my judgment, my question I'm asking is, okay, is this person, if I put them in a brainstorm, are they adding a new perspective? Is there a new voice that's being like, you know, or a new POV? a new set of life experiences that this person is coming with and adding to the gumbo that we have 
in our in our brainstorms. That's my my POV on things. It's you have to be very very discerning because that means that you have to say no to some people that you really like and think are dope. But you know, you have to be honest with yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit more about kind of the the, the niche of. Yeah or where you're at in, in your career and in your position for sure. of something like Zion happens, right? Yeah. Just for people that aren't necessarily familiar with BR's workflow, yeah. what goes into a moment like that? Like for how sure. many approvals are put in place? What does that mean on your end? Right. What does that mean if you're not on the clock? What does that mean for the people in SF? Right, right. You mean like this, this injury? Yeah, like or anything, or any, anything any, just not. any moment gotcha. that's Trending yeah. on sports. For sure, for sure. Um, so first, hopefully we've prepared for the moment. Yep. Assuming we've prepared for the moment, then we're ready and we have waves of content that are gonna go out instantly. Um, if something random happens, like Zion busts through his you know, Nike or something like that, first we're all on guard and waiting with the rest of the world. We're like, hold on, is he, is he hurt? How serious is it? Like. What, what's going on, and then our social programming team is the one that's gonna like jump in, and, like the news, like here's what's happening right now, and they're, they're the first voice that very often our audience is hearing from. Um, when it's something celebratory, that's when our moments team or our stories team is gonna jump in and they're gonna like find a way to extend the conversation or celebrate the conversation, more than anything match the mood and the emotion of the moment itself. It. So if Last season, Kristaps Porzingis has like a block on one end and goes down and has a fast break dunk on the other end. My team is the one that's having him fall through a Rick and Morty wormhole on one end of the court and then pop back up on the other end of the court and dunk, you know, and celeb celebrating that particular moment. Honestly, like injuries and things like that, we kind of, we sit that out. Honestly, my team is only touching it if there's a ton of outreach or well wishes and stuff like that from former or from other players on Twitter and stuff like that. We might do like a roundup type execution. Um, but we're really focused on celebrating moments and elevating it and, and you know, engaging our audience through uh, fun and humor. I think you guys are in a unique space in the sense that you're able to comment on any and everything that goes on in sports. But with that, there's yeah. probably a little bit of thought that goes into how that affects the athletes because they're also yeah. you're also their go-to for them. Yeah. So how do you kind of toe that line in, in having fun but also realizing there's people like Kyrie that yeah. are extremely sensitive to media yeah. and not necessarily blowing up a moment too much? Yeah, um, we live in the gray area. Right. There's no really. There's. there's I, I wish I could tell you there's like a magic formula that we that we follow, but it's it's very, it's editorial judgment. You know, we try to include as much context as we can. We're never trying to take someone's quote out of context, and we're, we're not trying to have like a, a gotcha moment or look how dumb this person, like that's not what it is. Um, but we're also, we're a news publication, we're, we're a lot of different things, and so we have, if something is public, we have to you know, express our POV on it um, and engage with our audience in the way that we want to engage with our audience. So I don't think that we have like, necessarily any particular athlete's feelings in mind. Right. But I would say we, we always want to do things that we can stand confidently behind and say like, okay, regardless of whether this person likes it or gets pissed at us and says, this is why we're trash and I'm deleting your app. Like, okay, well, we stand by what happened. This was very public and visible information. We didn't you know, embellish in your misery. All we did was report or share the information that was already you know visible to people so Absolutely. that's kind of it um so you guys have obviously expanded in a few different um platforms from br kicks to yeah. um soccer pages to yeah. you know br hoops yeah. tell us a little bit of about what went into that thought process to create those things why did you do it and sure. to what's next for sure um so the bigger that the br national account gets um the more, the more our, our POV and the type of content we do is gonna have to kind of spread, like in terms of different topics that we're gonna cover, but I don't think we're always gonna be able to go as deep on those topics um, as niche fans of amateur hoops or niche fans of sneakers or fashion would like us to on our national account. That's what those sub brands are for. The sub brands are for someone who is addicted to looking at pictures of 
Carl Anthony Towns walking into the arena with, and what kind of sneakers he has or whatever. Like, you know, um, that's what the kicks page is for. That's what, you know, we have, you know, our amateur hoops, our, our, our VR hoops account, and that's all centered around the stars of tomorrow. Who are, maybe you don't have an NBA jersey of this player today, but you will in about, you know, 18 months. And so that's what that account is for. Um, in terms of what's next, I'm not going to ruin any surprises, but there definitely are some sub brands that are that are coming for sure. It's definitely going to be an emphasis of ours. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's something I'm excited about because I really think that we're a brand that can talk about whatever we choose to. Um, I, I think that we're living in a time where people's interests are really like converging. There is no separation between, you know, music and fashion and. and pop culture and sport, like all these things are kind of converging. And so I think under our larger umbrella, we have an avenue to talk about a lot of different things. Absolutely. Um, so two last ones before we open this thing up for questions, because sure. um, I'm sure people have quite a few for you. Sure. Um, but the first of which is what goes into the brand voice, the brand tone, those type of conversations, mm -hmm. especially with now what's been an established brand across social platforms or the go-to yeah. for people to follow sports on social. Yeah. What are those conversations like and what got you to where you're at now to yeah. be able to be in that gray area? For sure. Um, with certain topics, so for, first I'll say with certain topics, we're going we're gonna to go we're gonna go newsy because of the tone or the tenor around that particular topic. So we're not like a political brand, but when you know certain athletes say certain things, like you probably will notice our caption is pretty straightforward and we're not really you know, leaning one direction or another. Um, fun and celebratory stuff, we will speak like we would speak in a group chat. We're gonna speak like our, I mean, the, the, the need for formality on social is kind of, it's unnecessary in those moments. And that is kind of like what dictates our, our conversations about it. But it's so, in, it's so intrinsic to like our team and what we do. I can't say that we have a ton of thoughts or conversations about um, this sounds too formal. It's more just like shades of gray, shades of like, okay, how casual do we want to be? And, and you know, um, let's, we, we can be looser, let's word it a little bit, let, let's shorten it, let's, maybe we can go a little longer, you know, like that kind of thing. So, right. yeah, it's not really a lot that we need to dig into. I mean, this is probably something that we, we kicked around years ago when we were, like, first building the team, but now it's, it's, it's well established. It's the last one before we open it up for everyone. Obviously, you guys work with Omar and House of Highlights and the team yeah. over there. Yeah. How do you guys ensure that... Uh, on, especially when it comes to the algorithms and feeds that are in place, that you're not hitting people over the head with the same content. What is that relationship like? Yeah. And how do you ensure that you're still putting out things that are mutually beneficial? For sure. Lots and lots and lots of coordination. I mean, you referenced Slack earlier. There's a Slack channel uh, or, or three or eight that, you know, folks that are working in real time late at night are reaching out to folks on the House of Highlights side and they're deciding, you know, we're going to run with this, we're going to run with that. Uh, okay, this is one where we might have some overlap. Okay, cool, let's make a note of that. Um, but that's, that's the extent of, you know, specifically, like, making sure that we don't hit people over the head, you know, with the same or, or duplicative content. Um, we want each brand to have its own voice and to have its own content buckets and, and not to feel like they're the exact same account. Um, but there will, there will be some overlap naturally. Um, an amazing NBA highlight, you might see it both places, maybe. But you know, we're doing as much as we can internally to, to prevent like, too much overlap. There should be you know, a lot that you experience from the HOH account that you're not going to get on BR, and that's good. Like that, to have a unique value proposition is a good thing. And I'll, honestly, I want the exact same thing for you know BR National, and then all of the sub brands we referenced earlier. Um, they should all have their own unique value proposition that uh, warrants a follow, or a comment, or a like, or whatever. Right. That answer was so thorough that they put the lights on. I didn't know that was happening. That's that's wild. Yeah. Uh, so we just want to open it up to to questions for for any questions that anybody has off the bat. Sure. Uh, question for both of you, because I think you guys would have different answers. But so specifically in basketball, uh, you have people. Uh, yeah, I'll stand up too. So uh, specifically in basketball, there's a lot of you know the meme accounts or the parody accounts. Um, in basketball, you have Dunk and Hoops Nation, which are pretty big. Um, how important are like the kids, like these kids are like 18. How important is someone like Buster to? 
you guys on the publisher side and then you guys on the NBA side, whether it's having them at games or leveraging them to create the content for you and then source it back to you guys? How, how does that play into your strategy? Uh, I, I'll lead. Uh, so the, the, the question, if I can uh, rephrase for the podcast listeners that end up listening to this, is how do we uh, act on influencers in the space and utilize their talents and how, how do those go, conversations go about? So especially on the team side and the organizational side of things, it, it differs depending on where you're at and what the organizational uh, in, initiatives are. I can say when I was in Sacramento, we had, un, I, I can confidently say, a near unlimited budget to do things like that because there was a push to be a global brand beyond just the Sacramento Kings. They wanted to be uh, the go-to team for kids in India to, to kids in China to everywhere. And so with that came the ability to work with a bunch of different influencers and have those conversations to try to find things um, that would make sense for us to engage with those folks. I can say at the Timberwolves, we're very nuanced about how we do um, and who we work with. And so, you know, it's a different budget, and I have different um, different initiatives that I have to kind of um, focus on. And with that, if there's something that's like kicks, for example, so one thing that we're doing um, is working through Facebook lead gens um, and focusing uh, on people that are interested in kicks and working with somebody called Minneapolis Customs who makes a lot of really cool kicks, uh, custom kicks for players um, on the WNBA and NBA side and based on matchups. So for example, we played the um, Portland Trailblazers earlier in the season. We were wearing our Prince jerseys. So you made a Prince shoe just for that night, created a lead gen ad um, for anyone who you know, was interested in Prince or whatever. Um, and then use that as a means to you know, pass that along to the sales team. Hey, let's get you in the door here, but you also have this really cool opportunity. And so we're using, utilizing influencers in a different way. Um, it's not necessarily just content driven, but it's more long form um, and, and trying to get them in the door too. Um, and even if they're not in Minnesota, trying to get them involved in our brand. So specifically on our social side, I'd say there's, there's two ways that, that I think about it. There's one where we're, you know, competitors with those folks. I mean, every time and, you know, folks that work on my team will tell you, like, it's, it's us versus the Internet. And some days or some nights during games, it's like, okay, the Internet won. Like, this kid in Wyoming had the gift that got shared 50,000 times or whatever, and it perfectly captured the moment from this particular game. All right, Internet, you got that one. You know, but next time, we're going to get it. You know, next time, that mama mentality, keep shooting. You know, we're going we're gonna to keep going. Um, but on the other side, you know, the very genesis of this team was, was built, was, was uh, informed by finding the best people who are creating content out there already. And if it's somebody in their bedroom or somebody that, you know, creates content around NBA games or NFL games on the side because they, they hate their job here, we went and found people and, and were like, would you want to do this full time? And so like that, that was kind of like the beginning. And so even to this day, if we find someone or we see someone who has a niche and, and, and is really good at doing a particular thing that we uh, you know, either want to do more of or we want to you know, properly find like, the person who's the father of this particular style, OK, cool. Like, let's email. Let's, let's get in contact. Let's figure out a way to you know, properly you know, compensate you and, and make it work both of our time. You know, so you know, this time during All-Star or this time during the NBA Finals, you can create this particular piece of content for us and um, you know, everyone's happy. You ever have one of those moments where somebody says something and you just get chills? He was like, all right, internet, you won. And I was like, damn, like I felt that. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. I mean, the inter it, it's, it's, you know, back to that question you asked earlier about, you know, comments and stuff like that. Like, it's tough to compete with literally every single person who has Wi-Fi. Right. You know, but that's what we're going after every single day. Right. And so that's why we're not hung up on one individual game we didn't win the matchup or we didn't win that you know I've, I've used a lot of basketball metaphors so I just always go to like we, we lost that possession we gave right. up a three okay cool we'll get it back yes hi I'm Brun I know you guys very well no I'm just kidding uh, I have two questions apologies one is for Shabazz and the other one is for both of you guys um, you mentioned that you've obviously like seen Bleacher Report do stuff and um, obviously some of it has translated to the team accounts and 
Uh, I was curious, what is one thing that maybe you have adopted or seen from Bleach Report, like something that we've done that you found a lot of success on at the team level? Then my second question was just uh, for both of you, what is the piece of content that you've been most proud of uh, during your careers that you've produced? Yeah, so uh, for the first part of that question, I'll say, especially in my time in Sacramento where we had that initiative, uh, especially on the digital front, to always be innovative and engaging in a different way that was not typical for an NBA team or a sports organization in general to do. We were very banter focused and um, I would say we would try to emulate some of the stuff that Bleach Report House of Highlights would do in our voice and tone. Um, I, perfect example of that is like um, we were going to summer league and summer league content like it's fun and engaging because you're seeing these rookies play for the first time but beyond that more often than not there's there's not too much from a team side um, that's engaging beyond the rookies so we're like okay how can we play play this up a little bit and we were playing the Lakers in a game and so I had the idea I went to my boss and I'm like what if we just went around Summer League, because every third person at Summer League is wearing a Lakers jersey, and interviewed them about their new rookies that don't exist. And this is a time where like Game of Thrones was obviously in its peak. So I literally just went with our camera guy and interviewed a bunch of Lakers fans about Ned Stark and Sean Carter, who's Jay-Z. And they were like going off. They're like, yo, he's, he's a promising prospect. Um, and I literally did that. We, we would have these conversations based on what we think national publications like Bleacher Report would pick up. So part of my job when I was in Sacramento, um, when I moved to a managerial role, one of the things that um, you know, would earn or merit um, a promotion or ha have those conversations, part of that was a national publications piece. So I was challenged X amount of times a month, we need to be in a national publication for what we do on the team side, that's not a highlight. And so I was, I was crazy about it. Like I was up till two. I'm like, what is Varun and Meredith and Brian? Like, what are they gonna do based on what we do that's not related to the on-court stuff? So, I mean, we did crazy stuff. Like, I'm sure you guys saw, um, we turned the Cleveland Cavaliers logo into an L, and that was one of the most retweeted NBA tweets of all time at the time, even over the Warriors winning a championship. And you know, there's conversations that had to be had to get to that moment. Would I do that at the Tim Rolls? No, because we have different initiatives. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I was always using BR as a way to, to push me in my mindset. Yeah. First, I have to say, just for clarity and transparency with the audience, Varun is my guy. Varun works on my team. He's my, in, he's my audience plant. So <laughs> there we go. That, that, that's um, my, my right-hand man on the team. So, uh, But if I'm, if I'm looking back at uh, favorite pieces of content, specifically from our group, I would say it's a tie. There were two, there were two pieces that really stand out to me. Um, when Salt Bay was actually like new and not like annoyingly like present on the internet, uh, we did an execution where I think it was Matt Ryan. Um, we we literally have some of the best designers on the planet. They literally made 3D cheese or whatever, and Salt Bay's there just like slicing through the cheese or whatever. It was Matt Ryan when they defeated yep. the Packers or whatever, and so he's just like putting salt all over this like sliced up Packers secondary or whatever. And I was like, this is this is brilliant. This is amazing. And of course, we're making um, making really compelling content out of you know a league where we don't have highlight rights. So, you know, that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, second, or tied for favorite, I would say, last NBA Finals, the fourth time we were seeing the Cavs and the Warriors, which we were all exhausted from, um, one of our producers did a, a fake trailer for the Finals, and it was just simulating like, yeah, we're excited once again, LeBron versus the Warriors, yep, we're gonna do it, and then it was fast forward 2025. Yeah, we got Riley Curry playing with the, <laughs> with the Warriors against Bronny Jr., you know, and then it was like, oh, Cyborg LeBron is back, it's, two, it's 2035. Um, really, really competitive, uh, really compelling, excuse me. And then again, I mean, we talk about the spirit of the actual event. That's what it felt like. The audience was actually just exhausted with this matchup and didn't really see any compel compelling argument for the Cavaliers against the, the you know, Monstars. So, uh, yeah, those would be my, my favorite, too. I've, I've got a few different to answer this question, so bear with me, but there's been, there's been some really cool moments, one of which was um, inspired, again, by BR. So 
Um, I'll start with the Cleveland L thing. I, I went into the locker room. I was in Cleveland during that game. So the folks back home tweeted that. And I got into the locker room. And within like two minutes, we had like 4,000 retweets. So like for us, especially on the team side, I'm like, That's this huge. is, it That's was huge. blowing up. I got into the locker room. It was DeMarcus Cousins. Aaron Aflalo had just hit a game winner. And I kid you not, swear to God, I got in the locker room. The dudes are going nuts. <laughs> They're like, oh, you did this? Like the whole, they were going nuts. They were dying at the tweet. And on the other side of things, there was other folks within the organization that weren't as pleased with it. So I just remember that moment um, just because we had people within our organization like fighting for us to keep that up. And then we also have people that are like, we should never do, it's LeBron. Like, Mm -hmm. why would you, Mm -hmm. he just won a championship. Like, why would you do that? But um, that was a memorable moment. Another one. that I was talking about, inspired by BR. So um, not going to lie, we uh, tried to poach one of your freelancers. Um, it happens. Uh, that worked on an illustration, Aaron Donna, mm-hmm. who we still work with sometimes. I still work with sometimes on the Timberwolves side because he's very talented. Yeah, for sure. So I know you guys had did those um, season opening like illustrations with all the little Easter eggs. Yeah. So we did one before last season or the season before for the Kings right. um, that had all these little Easter eggs like Costa Kufis was on a 2K poster <laughs> in the back because mm-hmm. everyone calls him 2K. Mm-hmm. Buddy Buckets literally had, or Buddy Heald had buckets in his hand to signify him being uh, Buddy Buckets. And the response was so tremendous that it literally turned into a piece of merch uh, because people clamored for it mm-hmm. and we were selling it on our social media night so that was really cool. But my favorite thing that's ever happened was I had the ability um, to go to Haiti with Scalabissier, who's a, a player now for the Portland Trailblazers, but he was on the Kings. And I got to cover him going home. He was part of the earthquake at the time. He has a really great story. Um, and he was uh, visiting home for the first time since the earthquake, now that he was in the NBA. And I was uh, walking with him and just on the side of the street, you know, in rural Haiti, yeah. um, saw the guy who helped um, carry him out of the rubble mm. to save his life. Wow. And I captured that moment. Um, and it wasn't anything that got like ridiculous. It wasn't 50,000 retweets. Mm-hmm. It wasn't 200 articles. You know, there was, I think BR actually did a, a piece on it. But mm-hmm. for me, that was the most impactful because it just yeah. saw, I, I just saw the, the impact that the game has had. And being able to capture that and be there for that moment was just insane and will always sit with me. Yeah, those are real stories that, that need to be told and they're not, they're not less valuable because they get less retweets Engagements. or less engagement right. and all of that kind of stuff. Um, to double back to your, your first point you made about you know, making fun of LeBron and people just being petrified, like, oh, oh my God. Like, they're, they're people too. You know, these athletes are people and this specific generation of athlete has like grown up with social media and right. as they are finding out when they get to a bigger platform, that thing they tweeted about Aaron Rodgers back in 2011 or that thing that they tweeted about LeBron or whoever else back in 2013 before they, before they got drafted, it's just a part of the social conversation. Like it's nothing personal. No one's attacking you or your character or who you are as a person, but the jokes will fly and right. sometimes they're about you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, any, any other questions? I have a question. Hi, I'm Jen. Shabazz, you mentioned poaching one of BR's freelancers. And you guys do so much amazing content mm-hmm. and obviously you work with so many talented individuals. And I think that as somebody in the business looking to create content is king, more and more of this really great, authentic, beautiful content, What suggestions do you have, do's, don'ts, tricks of the trade for working with freelancers Mm -hmm. um, and finding those types of talented people to bring on for your projects? I would say don't always look for people that, I mean, I think this sounds pretty simple, but it's difficult in practice, which is um, someone who's creating something that you don't currently make. um, Have some imagination with like how you can work with that person. You know, open up your um, your imagination or your creative capacity to like start to incorporate some things that they do uh, into your creative portfolio, like your your content buckets. Um, I think that with a lot of the people that we find, we're like the same thing. The same point I made about personnel and hiring people and who like what they're adding to the to the pot with independent contractors and artists and people that are literally all over the globe. We're finding people that do something unique and that do something special. Um, and so it's just being open to receive what this new artist does. Um, and then when you engage with them, 
really be clear on what you're trying to get out of the situation. Um, be clear, and by get out of the situation, I mean um, the, the type of content you're hoping to get out of it. And then also, like I mentioned before, be okay if this new thing you're trying doesn't perform the way these tried and true content buckets perform. They're not gonna, it's not a one-to-one. -one. We separate these things out, and I, I speak all the time, and Varun will tell you, is like analytics and performance and all that kind of stuff is only a part of how I assess our team's performance. It's great that we got 10,000 retweets and LeBron reshared this on his IG story. It's fantastic. Was it creatively ambitious? Did we push the boundary in some way? Like that's another metric as well that's obviously not like, you know, quantitative. You have to assess that yourself, but, um, you know, that I think you, we start to think about those things on the front end when we're working with artists. Um, so I, I hope that helps. Yeah. Other questions? Awesome. Must have nailed it. Cool. 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 Solid. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.